Erev Tov. Good evening. Uh, it is an honor for us tonight to welcome, uh, I'll say first start as Helen Avales' father, uh, Lord, Lord Professor uh, Turnberg, to speak to us about uh, Beyond the Balfour Declaration, which he's also written a book about. There are, uh, we say in Hallel, when we say our Hallel, we say, Hallelu et Hashem kol goim, shabechu kol haumim, ki gavar aleinu chazdo. Nations should praise Hashem, for he has done chesed, he has done good with Am Yisrael, with the nation of Israel. That would seem and irregular things, but there are those times in history where the nations do recognize great things and about Am Yisrael, of the nation of Israel, and I'm sure that the uh, Balfour Declaration was one of those special historical moments, which I'm sure we'll hear much more about. It's, uh, as I said, it's an honor for us to have uh, Lord Professor Turnberg, who was uh, actually real field if I understand right, is gastroenterology, and uh, is specialized for over six decades, decades in the field, and uh, wrote four books on the topic and over 150 professional articles, and was knighted in 1994 for his accomplishment in that, in that area of medicine, but since has also dealt a lot with uh, other topics, just like the topic we have tonight, and spends a lot of his time in the past years defending and promoting and doing, speaking in the good name of Israel in the House of Lords abroad. So it's a great honor for us to have you speak to us tonight, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot about Beyond the Balfour Declaration. Thank you very much. Well, Rabbi Kupperman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, and thank you for coming out on such a horrible evening. It's very kind of you to do that, and, and I know you only put the weather on to make me feel at home, uh, and uh, of course it's good to see my own uh, little support group here from the family. Uh, you know that the definition of one of the definitions of chutzpah. Chutzpah is when an Englishman comes to Israel to tell the Israelis about the Israeli history. That's my chutzpah for tonight. But uh, you might be relieved to know that uh, I'll not talk about how Israel and the Palestinians might settle their differences. Uh, there are many millions of Israelis, all of whom know how to do that. All of them have different opinions from themselves, from each other, and from the government. And if you want to know what I think about it, then you'll have to get my book. Uh, what I am going to talk about is what it was that induced Lord Balfour and the British government to support so strongly the establishment of a home for the Jews in Palestine, and why on earth they were spending so much time on it during the First World War that was going terribly wrong for them, for Britain, against the Germans in Europe. Why did they spend so much time on it? And having been so supportive in 1917, why in 1939 did the British government issue the notorious white paper that closed the door on immigration from Europe of Jews at a time when they needed it the most. And I'll talk about the Declaration now when there are enormous misunderstandings about what it is and what it was, and when there are so many, especially in, in England, who believe that it was the biggest error of judgment that a government could make, and there are others who think it was the most magnanimous gesture of an imperial nation for a persecuted people. And it's pretty clear that Balfour would never have imagined that a hundred years later, 
there would be this continuing conflict over what he described as this small notch of land that the Arabs couldn't possibly begrudge. He would have been amazed and disturbed to, have hear, to hear that the Palestinians were seeking an apology from the British government for the Balfour Declaration. When I, I visited Ramallah last year, and I'm still alive to tell the story, I went to the Palestinian Authority offices with a group of lords that we took from the House of Lords to have a look at Israel, non-Jews, one or two Jews, mostly non-Jews, to see what Israel was about. And we went to the West Bank, we went to the PA offices, and we met a man called Nabil Shath who said, it's all you Brits' fault for the Balfour Declaration that we're in the mess that we're in. Well, that didn't go down well with our peers, thank goodness, and it was very good PR for the Israelis, actually. Well, what was it? that brought this unlikely figure of Arthur Balfour to the aid of the Zionists in that remarkable way. Let me tell you a little about the man himself. He was very tall, very thin, very aristocratic, very languid in appearance, and he leaned on any convenient wall. And when he was in Parliament, he lay almost horizontal on the benches there. And he gave the superficial impression of someone for whom life was all too difficult. He, he was known for saying things like, nothing much matters and very few things matter at all. So there, even as a child, he had to have a nap in the afternoons. I can sympathize with that. <laughs> Once in Parliament, he wasn't taken too seriously until he was made Minister for Ireland, much to everyone's surprise. His fellow MPs couldn't understand it until it was realized that Lord Salisbury, the Prime Minister, was his uncle. And uh, his real name, Rob, uh, Salisbury's real name, was Robert Cecil. And when Bob's your uncle, anything's possible. <laughs> and that's what happened. It was a bit of a surprise. But later, he did a great job in Ireland, and he would became, a few years later, became Prime Minister for a few years, and he did quite well in that job, but he was out when there was a change of government. But by 1916, the critical years, we're now into the war, 1916, back in government, he was foreign secretary in David Lloyd George's uh, war cabinet. Lloyd George had may become prime minister, and he's, he had a wartime cabinet. So, now the question is, how did this highly intellectual, paragon of virtue, well connected with the aristocracy, come to support the Jews? And there have been many answers, not all of which have any substance to them. Was it perhaps the guilt that he felt at having passed an aliens bill when he was prime minister? This was a bill that restricted the immigration of Jews from Eastern Europe into England. The Jews were clogging up the east end of London, and uh, he passed a bill which reduced the numbers. Was it that? Well, it could have been. Was he guilty? Or perhaps it was to repay Chaim Weizmann for having invented a way of producing large amounts of acetone. He was a chemist, Chaim Weizmann, working in Manchester, and he'd produced a, a way of, of, of making acetone in large amounts that the government needed for explosives. Was it to reward Weizmann for that? That's apparently, you may be able to tell me, but I think that's taught in Israeli schools, that it was to reward Weizmann for this. I think it's an unlikely reason for him to have offered Palestine to the Jews. But that's what was thought. Some thought it was perhaps a way of gaining the support of the Americans get the powerful American Jews to put, push their president, uh, uh, Wilson, into the war on the side of the Allies. Perhaps it was that that uh, would be useful. They overplayed the power of, America, of uh, Jewish lobbies, as many have done since that time. And it was certainly a view at that time, but when America did eventually come into the war, 1917, when they did come into the war, it was nothing to do with the Jews, and it was all to do with the fact that the Germans rather foolishly were persuading the Mexicans to invade America. Can you imagine? 
Well, they were trying to persuade them to do that. And also, the German U-boats were sinking uh, uh, American ships. Then there was another question, whether it was strategically important for Britain to have a reliable ally in the Middle East who would fight with them against the Ottomans. This was the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire. The Brits wanted someone to, to fight with them, and they could rely on the Jews to do that. They couldn't rely on the disparate Arab tribes, many of whom sided with the Turks. Clearly, the Britons needed someone to help them in such a vitally important area to guard their oil supply on the one hand and also their route through the Suez Canal to India. Very important for them. This weighed very heavily with Lloyd George, not quite so much with Arthur Balfour. Balfour's support for the Jews had in fact predated all of those considerations. And none of the ones I've mentioned were really the real reason. He was a religious man. He was very conscious of the injustices inflicted on the Jews in over many centuries in Eastern Europe and spoke out against that on many occasions. Even in the 1890s, that's 20 years before the war, he'd been railing against the treatment of the Jews in Eastern Europe. He was convinced, for example, that Captain Dreyfus in France was innocent and that it was all a French anti-Semitic plot. So by the time he met Weizmann in Manchester in 1905, he was primed and Weizmann turned him on to the, to the Zionist cause before the First World War, 1905. Balfour needed little persuasion. Listen to what he was saying about the Jews then and a bit later on. We cannot forget how they, the Jews, have been treated during long centuries. Our whole religious organization of Europe has proved itself guilty of great crimes against this race. And in 1918, he wrote a remarkable introduction to Nahum Sokolov's book on the history of Zionism, in which he said, the position of the Jews is unique. For them, race, religion, and country are interrelated as they are interrelated in the case of no other race, no other religion, and no other country on earth. So if you're looking to try to define what Judaism is, a religion, a race, a nation, look no further. So it was those remarkable sentiments and words by Balfour that have to be remembered. Even on his deathbed, he told his niece that he looked back on what he'd been able to do for the Jews as the thing most worth his doing. So, that's Balfour. What about the declaration itself? It came in a letter, as everyone knows, November the 2nd, 1917, signed by Balfour and addressed to Lord Rothschild. It contained the critical sentence that revealed that the British government viewed with favor two interlocking ideas, the creation of a home in Palestine for the Jews, together with the proviso that nothing shall be done to prejudice the civil and religious rights of the indigenous population. Uh, those two elements have caused all the problems over the years, and it's clear that this, these ambiguous words were thought out rather carefully. Of course, the declaration was greeted with joy by the Jews, by the Zionists, but little notice seems to have been taken of it in the general press at the time. The world was distracted by the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, almost exactly the same time, November 1917. That was what the newspapers were full of. As an interesting aside, Chaim Weizmann was in uh, Geneva in 1900 or so, and he was preaching about Zionism to students in one cafe in Geneva, and across the road in another cafe, another Jew, Leon Trotsky, was preaching about Bolshevism at almost exactly the same moment, and then in 1917, they both got their way. Now there's a coincidence. <laughs> 
Well, despite the success of the Balfour Declaration, it's pretty clear that it wasn't an official treaty, nor did it have any legal or any other status. In the introductory sentence, Balfour simply says it was a declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations. And no thought seems to have been given to, the, to how one group, the Jews, could protect the rights of another group, the Arabs, who were intent on killing them off. But of course, to get the agreement of the government, the British government, wasn't so straightforward. Most members of the cabinet were in favor, including Prime Minister Lloyd George, who was very strongly in favor. It was the Jewish member of parliament, member of the government, Edwin Montague, who objected violently. He wasn't the only Jew who objected. The Rothschilds themselves were split down the middle. Few of the wealthy assimilated Jews really fancied the idea of coming to this deserted place and herding sheep and gathering olives. They were very comfortable where they were. Montague used many of the arguments one hears of today. Why should an assimilated Jew, well integrated into society, want a homeland elsewhere? If I'm an Englishman, why, who happens to be a Jew, why do I need it? Wouldn't a Jewish homeland cause more anti-Semitism than already exists? And wouldn't it create more pressure for Jews to leave England? Wouldn't it be much better to encourage better treatment of Jews in countries where they're less privileged? Isn't the whole idea a pipe dream that would create more difficulties for the Arabs as well as for the Jews? Montague certainly saw himself first as a, an Englishman and then as a Jew. That wasn't necessarily how others saw him. And his great friend, the previous prime minister, Asquith, Asquith certainly thought of him as a Jew. And he referred to him in derogatory terms as the Assyrian. In letters that he wrote, he wrote letters every day to this other woman, not his wife, Venetia Stanley. Very peculiar carry on. Even in the cabinet, even in the, when he was in the war office, he was writing these letters to Venetia Stanley every day. Well, his opinion of Montague wasn't improved when Venetia Stanley went off and married him, married Montague, and converted to Judaism to do it. Well, there you go. Well, Montague managed to hold up the decision on Balfour only for a little while. And he was sent off to India as the viceroy. The cabinet went ahead and approved it in his absence. Now, it's sometimes said that Balfour's declaration was purely a British affair without any international approval. You need to know that that idea flies in the face of all the evidence. It had the written approval of the French Foreign Office, Nachum Sokolov. Nachum Sokolov is an unsung hero of Zionism. Nachum Sokolov went to France, went to Paris, converted the French Foreign Minister Pico to the Zionist cause, and Pico wrote a letter saying we like the idea of a, a declaration of the Balfour type. And Sokolov went off to Italy and got the Italian government to agree. He even got the Pope to agree that it might be a good idea too. That was remarkable. The Russians were in favor, the Italians, the Americans, and it eventually had the belated support of Woodrow Wilson the President of the United States. So it clearly had international approval, a point worth making when all the blame is placed on Britain. And incidentally, Britain would not have been able to go ahead if it hadn't had the support of all its allies, and it did. Well, of course, that was far from the end of the story. Remember that the declaration had no legal basis, even though it was an official statement by the government, it was little more. <coughs> and it could have got lost at any time. It got, almost got lost several times. Here's the surprise. It wasn't immediately rejected by the Arabs. Hussein, the Grand Sheriff in Mecca, and his son, Prince Faisal, were generally supportive of Jewish immigration into what they thought of 
as a neglected corner of their vast Arabian lands. Weizmann and Faisal met on a number of occasions, and they got on very well indeed. They even drafted a, a document together which was in favor of Jewish immigration. And for a while, at least, the leaders among the Arabs were in favor with Jewish immigration, thinking it might be a good thing. Faisal spoke of the two branches of the Semitic family, Arab and Jew, who understood each other. He wrote to Felix Frankfurter in America, the Arabs, especially the educated amongst us, look with deepest sympathy on the Zionists' movement. And the daily newspaper in Mecca wrote in 1918 that the Jews were the original sons of the sacred homeland and welcomed them as brethren. The Grand Sheriff Hussein had been persuaded to get his Arab colleagues to revolt against the Turks with a promise of a huge Arab land stretching from Turkey in the north right down to Egypt in the south, all under their control, all under Hussein and his control, except for that small notch of land around Palestine that he was happy to allow for the Jews. But then, a secret agreement between the French and the British to carve up the Middle East after the war into their own spheres of interest came to light. Neither the French nor the British trusted the Arabs to rule themselves and were reluctant to even allow them to try in such a strategically important part of the world for the French and the British. So they decided they were going to keep control. And as soon as that came to light, Hussein as his son and his sons knew they'd been duped and it was only then that the Jewish influx into Palestine began to be regarded as the symbol of colonization by Western powers. And it was Western imperialism, not Jewish immigration, that turned the Arabs against the West. And while the Palestinian Arabs had always strongly resisted the influx of Jews, the much wider Arab displeasure only emerged when the Jews became the most obvious symbol of British perfidy. What of the legal basis of Israel's existence that we have to face when we face those people, those opponents who try to delegitimize Israel's existence? It was at San Remo in 1920, two years after the end of the war, where we move on from a simple expression by the British of viewing with favor a Jewish homeland to a much more significant, internationally agreed recognition of Jewish rights in Palestine. It's there in San Remo, the agreement for the Jews was formalized. Instead of simply viewing with favor, Britain was mandated to provide a Jewish home in Palestine. And furthermore, it was the first time that a Jewish, the idea of a Jewish nation, mentioned over 20 times, was put into the words of an international agreement. And the word reconstitution, rather than establishment of a home for the Jews also appeared. Reconstitution meaning pointing to the historical rights of the Jews in Palestine. And it was that agreement that was put up for full international approval two years later in the newly formed League of Nations when all 51 nations voted for it and none against. Contrast that with the UN today. And it was that League of Nations agreement that was taken up in full by the UN in their petition plan of 1947. But by the 1920s and 30s, Britain began to behave badly towards the Jews. And with Balfour and Lloyd George gone, the attitude changed. The Palestinian Arabs rose up against the, Brit against the Brits and the Jews, and there were riots in 1920, 1921, and 1929, and the riots killed many Jews, and many Arabs were killed. And the British government responded in the only way they knew, by restricting immigration of Jews into Palestine. But the nastiest deed, of course, came in 1939 with the notorious white paper, which was put in in a vain attempt by the Brits to placate the Arabs 
and they shut the door on immigration at the exact moment when the Jews needed to escape from the death camps of Europe. And it was that white paper that saw millions of Jews perish in the gas chambers and caused the Jews in Palestine and later in Israel to lose all the faith they had gained from Balfour and his declaration. Menachem Begin likened the Brits to Hitler and the Gestapo and had no compunction in fighting back with any aggressive tactics he could muster. Ben-Gurion famously said, as you know, we will fight the white paper as if there is no war, and we'll fight the war as if there's no white paper. But there is little doubt that without Balfour's declaration, the Jews would have had a very hard time getting a state of their own. And whatever Britain did later, before, during, and immediately after the Second World War, to try to restrict immigration and reduce the size of the promised land in various partition plans, it's difficult to get away from the absolutely essential role that Britain played in 1917, in 1920, and 1922 when Balfour and Lloyd George continued their message. And even though the promised land was nibbled away bit by bit in partition after partition, it was Ben-Gurion writing to his son from his house in London. Incidentally, he has a house in London in Maida Vale where there's a blue plaque on the wall saying Ben-Gurion lived here, if you want to see it. He said that the Jews should accept what was on offer, the almost indefensible sliver of land that was being offered, knowing full well that they'd be able to change facts on the ground in due course, and that, of course, is what they managed to achieve against all the odds. People now ask me what I think are the prospects for a solution to the current standoff between the Israelis and the Palestinians, as if I know. But it is fascinating to see that 100 years after Britain set the ball rolling for a Jewish state in the Middle East, now, at last, the more pragmatic Arab states Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the Gulf states are showing signs that they too, after 100 years, would be willing to accept a Jewish state as well. That, of course, all depends on Mr. Abbas recognizing a Jewish state, amongst other things, and Mr. Netanyahu curtailing his wildest expansionist plans. There are, as everyone knows, enormous advantages to be gained by both parties from a peace deal. Will it happen sometime soon? Hardly likely. Will it require new and braver leaders on both sides? Almost certainly. Is it worth all the effort? Of course it is. Thank you very much. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. Yeah. Well, there were several drafts, as you say. I don't know what the exact number was. But uh, Herbert Samuel, a Jewish member of the cabinet, asked Weizmann and his colleagues to produce a draft of a declaration that the government could take up. And Weizmann produced one, which included all the right things as far as we're concerned, including the idea of reconstituting the Jewish homeland in Palestine. That was the original wording. Uh, that went into the cabinet and the cabinet office played around with it for a while and changed, reconstituted to establish a home. So it was watered down. They also added the bit about uh, uh, not uh, getting around the religious and civil rights of the Palestinians that existed. That was to placate the Arabs. And it also had a bit to try and placate Montague, the Jew, uh, by saying that it wouldn't get round any of the rights of Jews in any other country in the world. So it was written to try and placate anyone and everyone in the final version. But there were several versions, went back and forth between Weizmann and his colleagues and the cabinet. Uh, 
Yeah. Is well, well, well. There's a variety of opinions, as you're hinting. Um, but the Prime Minister and her ministers have each said in different fora that the British government will mark with pride the, Balf the establishment of a Jewish homeland and the Balfour Declaration. Mark with pride the centenary of the Balfour Declaration. Those were her exact words. And uh, this was after the Palestinians tried to get the Brits to apologize. Uh, and so, at least the government says this. The two houses of parliament have quite different attitudes. The House of Lords is, has now become very much more centered on the positive sides of Israel. And that's been because a lot of work has been done in the laws to get to that point. And we now have about 90 of the Lords who are favorably disposed to Israel and we have an organization, a sort of subterranean organization, which briefs everyone uh, uh, about uh, any debate that's coming up or any question that's coming up about Israel. And we've always got volunteers to get up and speak. At one time, there were just the usual suspects, two or three of others, including myself, who would always get up and say something. Now, we don't have to because we've got a lot of allies. The Commons is quite different. There are very few Jews in the commons nowadays, and they have a hard time. And uh, certainly uh, the government itself, with the prime minister and her ministers, are generally favorably disposed to Israel, generally, although they did vote the wrong way the other day on Jerusalem um, in the UN. But uh, the Labour Party, as you probably know, is dominated by some very left-wing leadership, uh, some of whom may well be anti-Semitic and certainly anti-Israel. So the Labour Party has a problem. But the, in, the, in the Lords, we're in a much more satisfactory position, largely because of a lot of work being done. No, no. They were playing around with the borders. Um, Lloyd George uh, had a line which he said went from Dan to Beersheba. Now, I don't know of any lines that go from Dan to Beersheba very easily. Uh, and, uh, but that was the line he thought was going to be drawn. Before that, there, were, there was going to be the uh, sykes pico agreement, which carved up the Middle East secretly. Um, Palestine was just a big chunk of it. Palestine didn't really exist as a separate part of Syria. It was uh, a vilayet, a district or an area or a region of Syria. And its borders were never very clearly defined. Certainly then, they tried to define them, but it was only in the UN partition plan that they managed to get to some sort of borders. Uh, but even there, they were very vague. The Jordan River divided off part of Palestine and became Transjordan, as you know. So east of the Jordan River became the new country of Transjordan, later Jordan. But that was originally part of the Palestine that they thought of. Uh, the rest, as you know, has been carved up in different ways. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Just a quick word of thanks on behalf of the Ram and other I'd like to thank Neil Turnberg for coming out and uh, today sharing some insights. And uh, we have a, sh a small token of our appreciation. Uh, come back soon when you publish your next book, which is available here and on Amazon. Yeah. It's